Andrew. Well, growing up at Thanksgiving and Christmas, uh, when we were gathered around the table, my mom almost always made us go around in a circle and say what we were thankful for. Now, I'm curious, how many of you over the past couple of days did something like that? Kind of curious, raise your hand, I want to see. So a good, good number of you. Well, I have to admit, that wasn't always my favorite activity to do. Um, probably mainly because I'm not necessarily uh, naturally a thankful person. Now, some of us tend to naturally be thankful, and some of us aren't. Now, I'd love to see, if you're naturally thankful, I'd love to see you raise your hand. Let's just see, let's see some hand raise. You're naturally thankful, and I just raised my hand as an example, not because I'm naturally thankful. What if you're not naturally thankful? You can, any of you can admit that. And again, some of us, uh, the research shows some of us are wired and we are more thankful and others aren't. But I think that my mom knew something that I didn't learn until a lot later, that expressing gratitude is critical to our well-being. Expressing gratitude is critical to our well-being. And I think kids, that's why as parents, uh, we are regularly encouraging you to say thank you, Uh, to express gratitude, and the challenge is sometimes we as adults, even though we tell you to do it, we aren't the best at modeling it. But there's been a lot of research in the last 20 or 30 years on the positive aspects of gratitude, and so here's just a few things that gratitude helps us do. It improves our sleep quality, it helps us regulate our stress, it reduces uh, symptoms of anxiety and depression, it can reduce pain, Uh, It's also correlated with lower instances of substance dependence. So being grateful has a number of benefits in our lives. Now, this may sound like bad news for those of us that are not naturally grateful, but the good news is that we can influence how grateful we are. The truth is that we have a choice. I came across this quote by a G.K. Chesterton writer and philosopher, and he says, When it comes to life, the critical thing is whether you take things for granted or take them with gratitude. Whether, when it comes to life, the critical thing is whether you take things for granted or take them with gratitude. Now, we'd probably all acknowledge that gratefulness or being thankful is important in our lives. Uh, You know, especially this time of year, we come off of Thanksgiving, we've done an activity, we feel like we should be grateful. But this morning, one of the things that I want to do is challenge us to be, to more than feel grateful, we need to express it. And there's two reasons that I think we need to go beyond just having a general sense of being grateful. And the first is that expressing gratefulness helps us to become more grateful. If you're like me, sometimes if I'm not feeling terribly grateful, I just feel like I need to kind of grip my teeth and kind of think grateful thoughts and kind of muster up some strength to kind of change kind of my attitude and my posture. But the reality is that generally doesn't work. In fact, the opposite works when I'm not feeling particularly grateful. If I begin to rehearse and express the things that I'm grateful for, it begins to change who I am. So I'll give you an example. Friday morning, my wife gets up and says, hey, let's go for a run. Uh, Being the dutiful husband, I agree to go for a short two-mile run with my wife. If you were outside on Friday morning, it was 22 degrees. And so shortly into the run, I was not feeling particularly grateful. And then we had this moment where while we're jogging, she likes to talk and she likes me to talk usually to kind of entertain her as we go. And she looks over and she says to me, what's your message on this weekend? And I had this moment where I was rehearsing all the things that I really wasn't very happy about, about being out there in 22 degrees, and so I started to rehearse all the things that I was thankful for. Boy, the air is really fresh when it's 22 degrees outside. It feels, you know, uh, I'm thankful that I can run, I can be out here with my wife. And so I began to find myself, my mindset beginning to shift from a posture of being frustrated about being out there to a posture of gratitude. Now, I think expressing gratitude is important for a second reason. We've talked about a lot of benefits for those of us, you know, for us, but expressing gratitude is important for those around us as well. 
You know, if I've got a friend and they've done something kind for me and I don't say thankful or I don't say, if I don't express it, they may begin to wonder if I'm thankful. And if that pattern is repeated over and over and over again, they're probably going to doubt whether I'm thankful. And so if I don't express gratitude, even if I am, I may actually appear ungrateful even if uh, I am. And so Pastor Andy Stanley says it this way. He says, unexpressed gratitude is experienced as ingratitude. Unexpressed gratitude is experienced as ingratitude. Now, I may love my wife, but if I never tell her that, she might begin to wonder. Um, In the same way, if I never say thank you to those that are closest around me or those that have positively impacted my life, they may begin to wonder and they may begin to doubt. Eventually, they may be experienced Uh, my lack of expressing thanks as ingratitude. The truth is we don't get the full benefit and those around us don't get the full benefit of gratitude when we don't express it. In fact, I really wonder if it actually is gratitude if we never express it. So in addition to all the personal benefits that we receive when we're grateful, the research also shows that gratitude helps build and strengthen relational connections between people. It's like there's a connection. If Rob does something nice for me and I take the time to express thanks, um, it strengthens our connection. It builds a bond between us. And if I don't do that over time, that bond is, is not as strong. In fact, if we don't express thanks, I think it short circuits something in ourselves and in others. And I believe that there's also spiritual benefits for expressing thanks. And we're going to look at a story uh, of Jesus as he interacted with some men. And we're going to turn in uh, our Bibles to Luke chapter 17. Uh, There's a Bible in the seat in front of you. It's on page 870. And so Luke chapter 17. And there's a story. And we're going to be in verse 11. Let me say hello to those of you that are online. Glad that you're joining us this morning. Luke chapter 17. So as Jesus continued on towards Jerusalem, he reached the border between Galilee and Samaria. As he entered a village there, ten men with leprosy stood at a distance crying out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Now, this story took place a little later in Jesus' ministry, and word had gotten out that he was a healer. In fact, he'd healed others with leprosy and others with various sorts of diseases. And what we begin to see here is this group of men who are um, recognized that Jesus has the ability to heal them. And leprosy, uh, what we call Hansen's disease, uh, is something that causes nerve damage. And the way that it worked is, uh, is when I would lose feeling in my hands or my feet, if I would get a cut or a scrape, and it would begin infected, I might not begin to feel that. And so over time, this led to wounds on people's bodies. Now, thankfully, uh, there's a cure for this today. Uh, Antibiotics uh, helps cure it. In fact, over the last 20, 30 years, about 16 million people have been cured of leprosy. So until recently, this was a significant problem. And in this day, they didn't have antibiotics, and so the only way to treat leprosy was through quarantine. Um, And so you see these men standing a little bit further away from Jesus and calling out to him, and and this will make sense in a moment. So Jesus looked at them and he said, go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed of their leprosy. Now, back in the day, the priests did a lot of things. Obviously, they were uh, a religious figure and they did things to enable worship, but they were also sort of public health officer. And so when you were sick or had a skin disease, you would go to the priest and you would show yourselves to the priest. In fact, they had a list of instructions uh, that described how, what they were supposed to tell you to do. And if your skin disease was serious or not serious. Now, I'm just thankful pastors don't have to do this in their job description. But people don't come into my office and go, hey, can you look at this rash and see what do I need to do about it? Uh, In fact, in uh, Leviticus 13, there's detailed instructions. If you want something to read, it's a little gross, actually. Go read Leviticus 13 later, and there's all these instructions. And so you had to go to the priest uh, for him to tell you if when you were sick what you were supposed to do about it, and you had to go back to the priest 
uh, when you seem to be healed. And so Jesus sends these men to the priest, and they, they trust what he said. They begin to go to the priest, and on the way, they're healed. Now, Leviticus 13 would tell you uh, what the priest would, what guidance they would give you if you had a serious skin disease. It says, those who suffer, Leviticus 13, verse 45, it's up on the screen, those who suffer from a serious skin disease must tear their clothing and leave their hair uncombed. They must cover their mouth and call out, unclean, unclean. And this was to make others aware that you were, had something and they needed to keep their distance. And as long as the serious disease lasts, they will be ceremonially unclean. They must live in isolation in their place outside the camp. Now, back in this day, without antibiotics, if you had a serious skin disease like leprosy, it was like serving a life sen sentence. You were isolated from your family. You had to move out. You probably had to beg to survive. It was a difficult life. And short of a miracle, uh, you were going to be living this way for the rest of your life. Now, it's interesting in reading this passage, I've just been reflecting on the past couple of years and thankful that uh, we've had to experience masks and being separated from family. So we all have a little bit of a small taste of what this was like. So Jesus sends them to the priest and something happens. They're healed on the way. Let's continue reading in verse 15. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back to Jesus shouting, Praise God! And he fell to the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him for what he had done. And this man was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, Didn't I heal ten men? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And Jesus said to the man, Stand up and go. Your faith has healed you. Now, we have no idea of the sense of time when he sent these men to the priest. We don't know if they walked for 15 minutes. We don't know if they walked for an hour. We don't know if they walked for a day. There would have probably been some distance. We don't know if they were healed immediately. And I wonder what it was like for them to begin to walk and think, I still have leprosy. I'm heading to the priest, but I'm trusting Jesus. But at some point, they were healed. And we don't know whether it was after they had seen the priest that the man returned. But it's interesting Jesus' response. He says, weren't ten healed? And I don't know if he said this with a sense of sarcasm, if he said it with a smile on his face. But I wonder what happened to the other nine. I'm sure that they were excited, they were thankful for their healing, but maybe they thought, look, I've shown myself to the priest, I'm healed, I'm going to head back and m make up for lost time and reconnect with my family and my loved ones. And I think this is one of the first things that we can learn about expressing gratitude is it costs us something. Expressing gratitude takes us time. Uh, this Samaritan leopard that was he leper that was healed uh, had to walk back to Jesus and begin to express his thanks. Now, Jesus praises this man who happens to be a Samaritan, and if you were here last week, you knew that the Jews had a negative perspe perspective of the Samaritans, but Jesus praises this man, and it's fascinating that he's the one that returns. And it, we're, we can tell from the story that there was some mix of Jews and Samaritans, and that's one of the things that I think pain and disease does it can be a great equalizer and in these camps there was probably a mix of people that were Jews and Samaritans but Jesus can tell that there's something deeper in this man's heart that has transpired when he returned in fact it's interesting the word that the man uses or it says when the man Samaritan saw that he was healed the word for that meant that there, he had a sense that there was uh, he was cured and he returned to bodily health but the word that Jesus uses for healing when he says, your faith, uh, when he, let me look at the verse, he says, your faith has healed you. The word that he uses there sometimes is used for physical healing, but more often than not, it has a reference or a hint at spiritual healing. Jesus saw that there was something in this man that went deeper than just his physical healing. In fact, we see something in the way that the man returns to Jesus. He falls down at his feet. He adopts a posture of humility, and he begins to thank Jesus for the gift. But even more than that, he thanks the giver of the gift. He gets this right as he says, 
he's shouting, praise God. He's thankful for his healing, but even more, he's thankful for God, for the blessing of, these heal of the healing. And I think this is the core of what worship looks like for us, as we celebrate God in the way that he's blessed us, but we also celebrate just his goodness to us, and we celebrate for who he is. It's why the, Hebrew has, the Hebrews or the Jews had so many psalms that focused on God's blessing and God's thankfulness. They were being trained to rehearse and to celebrate God's goodness, even when times were bad. Now, was this really a big deal? The fact that one man came back and said thanks? Well, apparently, Jesus thought it was a big deal because he pointed out that the nine didn't return. The reality is for these men is that they would have spent the rest of their lives begging beside the road, separated and isolated from their families, living a, a really awful existence. Now, the truth of this is that none of us want to be the nine, and sadly, their lack of gratitude is recorded for all to see, uh, and it's captured for all time. I'm thankful that no, my, gratitude, my lack, occasional lack of gratitude doesn't get published for everybody to see. Now, if you're more curious, if you're curious about this story, uh, there's a link in the Grace Fishers app in the sermon notes. There's a fascinating Bible.com dramatic kind of first-person telling of this story that I would encourage you to check out. I actually thought about sharing a clip of it, but it was a little bit too intense. Well, my hope and my prayer for us at Grace Fishers is that we... Um, become like the 10th leopard, that we grow in thankfulness together. And so I want to share three stories this morning of how I see that beginning to happen. And there's also practical ways that you can begin to apply this as we begin to share these stories. And so the first story is I'm going to just share briefly about my journey. I've shared that I'm not particularly grateful, but about five years ago, I would say that began to shift. Uh, Pastor Jeff Unruh is one of our pastors here at Grace, kept referring to this book called A Thousand Gifts or One Thousand Gifts, and he talked about how it had prompted him to begin to practice this idea of thankfulness. Now, this is written by a gal named Ann Voskamp, and you might think um, that this, her story is like a hallmark story, that it's a feel-good thing, and she's just naturally a grateful person. Well, she has a difficult and painful story. And really, the story is all about her learning to express gratitude and record it in the midst of those moments when she's not thankful and when she's full of pain. And so I read the story and I began to do that. I began to record moments and it's begun to build a practice in my life and heart like when I'm out on a run with my wife and I notice that I'm not being grateful to begin to rehearse God's faithfulness and express that. And I had a moment even this week when I was preparing for this message was I was really overwhelmed by two things. The first is I was overwhelmed with gratitude for all of you. Um, you are an amazing group of people that are generous with your time and your resources. You're generous in spirit. And I was just thankful for the journey to serve as a pastor and walk alongside you. And I was also thankful for God's gratefulness over the past year. We've been going on this adventure for those last six to eight months as we've launched out as a new congregation. I feel like God has shown up time and time again on this journey. In moments, and he's done things ahead of us that we didn't even need known until we got to that point. And so I have been incredibly blessed by you and by God. I also want to share a little bit about Jeff Asher and his journey on thankfulness. And Jeff has served as our, uh, one of our elders a couple of years ago. He's one of our men's group leader. And this is what Jeff wrote. He said, several years ago, I began a weekly discipline every Sunday to reflect back on the week and journal about the week on what had blessed me or who had blessed me. And then I texted my friend, Eddie Creekbaum, and he agreed to do the same. It has grown our sense of connection as I see his love and desire to leave his son, lead his sons, Eli and Alex, well. And as I see his love for his wife, Casey, and his love for his failing mom and others who mean so much to him. And I've looped other family members and friends into this as well, like my brother who sends back his own list of gratitude. I also reflect on this at the end of the year as part of my New Year's tradition. 
And so Jeff has learned to practice gratefulness, and Jeff is one of those people in my life that regularly says thank you, thank you, and he just blesses me with his gratefulness. And then I want to share one other story, and this is a, a little more challenging story. It's uh, by somebody that's part of our congregation named Jen Nelly. And Jen is, again, one of those people that I see expressing gratitude. And so I asked her to share a little bit about her gratitude journey. She said, my gratitude, my journey with gratitude has been just that, a journey. It's easy to find gratitude in the Norman, Walk, Norman Rockwell moments of life. The family gathered around the table or reading peacefully by the fire, the sunset on the beach, the kids all getting along. But what about in moments of irritation and inconvenience when the traffic makes you late or a coworker drops the ball or the school calls and you have to quarantine again? In those moments, grumbling seems to come more naturally than gratitude. And there are the moments when the bottom falls out, when life as you know it will never be the same. Can gratitude coexist with grief or suffering? Our family had this moment in the fall of 2016, and, that time, and at that time, I would have said no. Suffering eliminates the ability to be grateful. Stuck in a pattern of grief and being overwhelmed, I focused on the parts of our life that were hard and the loss of the future that we had envisioned for our family. My anger at God for leading us down this path was blinding, and I was determined to finding a new route, with or without him. But when your fists are clenched, you can't receive the gifts all around you, and you miss the reasons for gratitude. Yet God remained with us, and slowly we began to see his goodness and provision in ways that were undeniable. While our situation didn't change, we felt his presence in the midst of our suffering, and we chose to be thankful. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. For years, I struggled with the truth of this verse. Life didn't feel good. In fact, some season and days have been downright awful. But the ne very next verse says, For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son. God's definition of good doesn't always mean for our comfort or our safety or happiness. His good means that we will become like Christ. Of all the things that I've experienced in my life, this journey has made me more like Jesus than anything else. So in a sense, it has been good. And I can be grateful for the way that it's changed me for the better. I don't say this lightly. I still grieve the life that I thought I would have and sometimes feel self-conscious with our family because it looks different than most. I struggle with doubt and fear and a lack of trust. But through the unwavering support of my husband, the encouragement of dear friends, meeting with the counselor, and constantly reminding myself of God's truth, I have found that my life can have both hardship and goodness, grief and gratitude. At Thanksgiving, we tend to focus on harvest and abundance. But if this season finds you in a place of hardship and emptiness, take heart. God is still there, and that alone is a reason to be grateful. Would you join me as we pray? Father God, we just want to take a moment and say thank you. Thank you for the way that you have moved in our lives and our hearts. Thank you for the many blessings that you have given us uh, through this last year. And I want to say thank you for the people that you've put in our lives that bring us blessing as well. Father, we pray that you would help us to not take them for granted, but to express our gratitude and our thanks for the blessing that they are for their presence in our lives. And I pray, Father, that you would help us to become more grateful day by day. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.